How do you think the industry, from a pure science research perspective, has advanced, uh, let's say, over the last 12 months? TDR on location in Denver, Colorado at the MAPS Psychedelic Science Conference. Our next guest up, James Lantier, CEO of Mindset. Good to see you back on the podcast. Shad, amazing to be here. <laughs> I love the way he is, huh? <laughs> Joseph Arujo joins us this time, Chief Scientific Officer. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. How are you enjoying your time out in Colorado, gentlemen? Beautiful state, great conference. <laughs> <laughs> love the way you sell it, right? <laughs> so let's begin. Uh, big news. Uh, you got news from the MHRA, which is equivalent to the FDA over in the UK, Yep. that you can actually fast track to a phase two inpatient trial. So elaborate on what that is and most importantly, why investors should care. Yeah. So it, it's, a, it's a really meaningful milestone for us. So in a couple of ways. So, you know, number one, being able to take MSP 1014 directly into phase two. So just to remind people, usually phase one is about, um, you know, assessing safety. Phase right. two is where you really start, um, you know, getting a, a readout or a signal for the efficacy of a drug. Okay. And so that's that's huge for us because phase two is really like the main for most drugs is like the, the big inflection point in terms of like determining value. And uh, and with this guidance or allowance from the MHRA, that's going to make MSP 1014 really one of the most advanced uh, clinical stage psych next generation psychedelic drugs. It's great. So it's a, it's a huge, huge win for mindset. And frankly, you know what we've been saying about our you know overall plan for mindset is to really you know take mindset from where we've been, which is in our view, you know, probably the the leading, you know, preclinical discovery yep. company to yep. being, uh, you know, really now one of the leading clinical stage, uh, you know, psychedelic biotechs on focused on next That's generation great. drugs. And this is great. this is it. This is like a huge decisive move for us. That's great. What's the say, Joe? Both the company being the chief scientific officer advanced to a phase two. You must have been obviously happy to hear that, but. To James's point, like there's a lot of investors that do look at you guys as perhaps the industry leader when it comes to innovative drug development. Um, what's what's this say for the company? Yeah, we, we were ecstatic. I mean, we went to MHRA uh, mid last year with the hope of moving into a phase one and got guidance from them to move directly into patients. Why why the MHRA? The um, the regulatory pathway in the UK seems to be uh, quite favorable to psychedelics okay. right now. So there's been there's okay. been a bit of a booming industry there and I think we've been opportunistic. We've been working with Clerkenwell Health there. They've, they've really helped us uh, move this along with MHRA and lo and behold we, we got the approval. So it really from from a from the perspective of the value in the compound, this basically shaves off two to three years wow. that we would have had to spend, which, wow. you know, cuts into patent life. So we're gaining that value and we're going to have a readout in patients, you know, within ideally the next year or so. And and that would be tremendous. How excited are you guys for the industry? Because I like the, over the next 12 months, because I don't have to remind you guys what's happened in the last 24 months, but I've been saying to a lot of my viewers that we are going to see a small group of companies last. But for the ones that obviously have a clear pathway to revenue and have a strategy in play, the opportunity is immense. Um, you're part of that conversation, right, James? Yeah, I mean, you, you know, I mean, we've we've had this conversation at different points along the way, right? Yeah. Over I, I, again and again, you know, I for, for us the the opportunity set is is you know we think is is you know bigger than ever, right? So and and, and we're all you know jazzed about what's happened with MSB 1014 because it's a psilocin pro drug. So it's, it's, you know, structurally has some similarities to psilocybin. The data with psilocybin just keeps getting better and yeah. better. It's on a fast track to, you know, regulatory acceptance. 1014 gets to piggyback off of that. But if you kind of go up to like an 80,000 foot level, look at what's happening in, uh, you know, in the industry with, you know, some of the, 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 
the I think I'd say even sort of like unexpectedly really good news that yeah. come out around you know let's say like the success of Spravato, right? Yeah. So just answering really. What was the stat we shared? Was it 130 million last quarter? Did like 130 million in the first quarter, which yeah. was up over 80 percent, you know, from the prior year. It's on its way to being a blockbuster drug, and that's a drug that you know has a a lot of deficiencies when you compare it to psilocybin. Yeah. Um, and I think just that that's the success of that drug and kind of like answering this question that a lot of folks have around, you know, the scalability of drugs that uh, psychedelic therapeutics that you're going to have to take by necessity in a specialized clinical environment. Right. Like that's a decisive answer that, you know, there's demand from patients that's dragging that drug through. So I think, you know, the... Yeah, the opportunity, like just based on the data, just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, you know, the retail comes and goes in, in the in the you know the public markets, and, and we try not to get too distracted by that. And I think we've done a good job of just focusing on what we have to you know deliver on to make our business successful. Do you guys look at say a company like Compass that has data that's supposed to come out in the fall? as hoping for the best for them related to psilocybin? Absolutely. Like, Absolutely. Yeah. You, you know, you know uh, we have an enormous respect for them. They've done yeah. a tremendous job advancing, uh, you know, their formulation of psilocybin um, through the clinical process. We, we want to see those first generation drugs be successful because that's going to make it that much easier for us to get our, you know, optimized second generation drugs, you know, forward. Absolutely. Got to love these mosquitoes in Colorado, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'd like to ask you, it's been a while since I spoke to you last, uh, Joe, but how do you think the industry from a pure science research perspective has advanced, uh, let's say, over the last 12 months? Yeah, I, I think, you know, when we were asked that question a couple of years ago, you know, the answer was there's still a lot more data to collect. And, and I think that's still the case. But in the last 12 months, we've gotten more clinical data that's supportive of an efficacy effect. You know, the two big differentiators here, I think, are the rapid onset of effect, which you don't see with standard antidepressants, and this durability. Some studies are suggesting, you know, patients are, are you know, symptom-free for a year, so after one or two treatments. So that that's getting, you know, there's more data demonstrating that. Yeah. That's kind of changing at yeah. least. From a clinical perspective, you know, it's building confidence that these drugs might have an effect. You know, that's being balanced with a lot of, um, you know, chatter around, you know, this being natural occurring medicine wellness. But from the beginning, our, you know, we, we felt that there was a tremendous value in, in taking this drug discovery, traditional drug development route. You know, ultimately, the goal for us is about patients. And in order... To help patients, big pharma will have to get involved. And so yeah. you kind of have to fit within that mold and, and use that to, to help patients eventually. And I think um, that's what we're seeing opening up and a real possibility that uh, companies like Compass, MAPS, and, and ourselves will really get a drug to patients in the foreseeable future. Yeah. Refresh my viewers your background and your connections uh, with big pharma prior to joining Mindset. Right. So, so I'm... Uh, a behavioral pharmacologist, neuroscientist. I've spent the majority of my career uh, running a contract research organization that's been predominantly focused on helping companies develop novel drugs for neuropsychiatric and neurological diseases. Wow. So I've not worked within pharma, but I've worked beside pharma, I would say, uh, with pharma. You know the questions uh, that need to be asked. Especially at the preclinical level, right? Yeah. So I think one of that was a big advantage to us in being able to move those early assets quickly, being able to select differentiated compounds, and also building a story that big pharma would understand from a from a you know a, a study perspective, yeah. a preclinical perspective. And I think that was really well validated in this collaboration with Atsuka. Yeah. Well, outside of your Sunday morning pickup hockey team, how did the two of you meet? <laughs> <laughs> how did you trade two meet? Um, we, uh, I, I met Joe through, um, some, some common friends we had common, yeah. very, very early, you know, seed investors in, uh, in mindset who were looking for, uh, you know, a, a, a CEO to, to help them grow the business. And I'd always really been fascinated in this yeah. class of drugs. Yeah. 
um, as just a lay person. I was aware of the the research and the data, but then yeah, what's really sold me on on getting involved in in mindset um, was this strategy that Joe and the other founders had devised for you know the market. This focus on next generation drugs as being where ultimately you know pharma would inevitably you know, focus their energy and their investment. And I just thought this made, you know, a huge amount of sense. And they also really had the right people for the yeah. project. So yeah. so Joe's background in behavioral pharmacology, Malik Flossy, the medicinal chemist that he'd recruited to the project, like right opportunity, you know, right people at the right time and good people. So like you can't pass up an opportunity. Joe, would you say like a lot of your background was one of the reasons or like, to help nurture and develop the relationship that you, the partnership that you guys have right now with uh, Otsuka? I, I think, I think it helped, you know, I, I think when we looked, when we were first talking to investors, um, you know, it was really hard to get the message across. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of, once again, chatter on psilocybin mushrooms, how those could be deployed. And certainly I think my background helped build the, the sort of language of, 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 of science that would help demonstrate what we were really building to, to those companies. So I, I think, I think it was helpful. How engaged are they now compared to when you first had the conversations of doing research pertaining to this? Cause I'm sure it's changed drastically. Is it not? Who? Big pharma in general. Big pharma. Yeah. We've seen, we've seen, um, we've seen a tremendous sort of change in, yeah. in our ability to to speak with big pharma, get their attention. They're certainly looking at the space. Yeah. Um, I think there's still questions around, you know, the importance of the hallucinogenic psychedelic effect. Uh, but something they don't want. Something they don't want, I think, due to uh, a sort of, you know, classically being risk aversive. Of course, um, this is one of the questions that needs to be answered. You know, I think we have you know, the data suggests today that 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 mystical experience is going to be important. I don't know that it can be completely separated, but, you know, that's part of the drive mm -hmm. of science is to understand and learn that. Um, and I think if that were to happen, you'd see a lot of big pharma come in. But I think also, you know, you have trailblazers like Atsuka. And it, and I think if, if they move forward and have positive uh, data, you know, and with one of our compounds, their compounds, um, I think there'll be a lot of followers. I think that'll be a tremendous uh, inflection point for big pharma. How would you best describe Otsuka as a pharmaceutical company in comparison to their peers with uh, what you've learned so far with them? Well, well, I think you know w what we've what we've seen with them, and also the 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 feedback we've heard from um, you know from from other you know CNS drug companies. Yep. Um, yeah, you know, is they have a. A, a tremendous reputation as really like a trailblazer in, in yeah. psychiatry. Um, they have really, I'd say, like a, a sterling reputation. And so, um, in fact, you know, really because of our collaboration, it's been really easy for us to, to you know, talk to or, or get connections at other CNS drug companies because uh, of the level of respect that they have for uh Yeah. Okay. Well, it must feel great coming to a conference like this. And I'm sorry, like a lot of cr questions is big pharma here companies obviously looking for partnerships you're in that situation right now so um maybe a quick update on how it's developing and um you know i'm assuming it's going still great yeah everything is going you know really really well we don't have the same uh you know disclosure schedule of of you know a lot of the more sort of junior you know public companies where you're putting in a press release every 15 minutes <laughs> Talking with that before, you know, but um, this but, just in, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Read all about it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I mean, I think I could say like the programs are going, you know, swimmingly well, right? So right. We, we the last substantive update that we put out about um, the programs was one back in the fall to say that we had selected some leads from uh, Family Two, which are the sort of third generation psilocybin analogs, yeah, short and duration. Um, and, uh, and those are in IND enabling studies. All that work is, is, you know, going, um, really, really well. So well, hopefully we'll have some more updates we can share on that soon, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's gone exactly. I think as everybody had hoped it would. Conference is good, good for you guys. You think it's nice to see 12,000 tickets, all the conference it's, like this, right? It, it's, it's great. It just, it's, it's, you know, yet another kind of real indication of the, the growth. 
of the of the growth and of you know the uh, the openness of of people to you know these types of of treatments yeah it's great well, i think it's you know the last time i was at that conference center was for one of the biggest alzheimer's meetings and this is more than double that size well so. that auditorium this morning <laughs> i think there was like fifteen thousand people yeah. one it was huge and that's just one place one room like they had a ton of people at this conference it still continued this week but government officials it's packed right and in 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 a in, in, uh, like a really a wide spectrum of people from yes. all kinds of different walks of life, all kinds of different, you know, probably across the political spectrum. It really goes to show you that there's really a kind of a universal interest in these in these drugs because of what they're capable of. You hear these stories, though, of homelessness that's picking up everywhere. And when you start to get like a visualization as to what's happening and what we are in mental health, like I was speaking to Peyton Nyquist last week and he was telling me that the average cost for the healthcare system annually for people with PTSD is twenty thousand dollars. That's like that's a lot of money. So one can only hope the data proves to be promising because uh, you know we can't continue down this road of capitalism at all costs. Where you know it's a situation where we can't keep all the way we're going. But it's great and hopeful to see. With and that's not just me saying nice fluffy things. It's incredible to see what we're seeing this week and what we're learning at this conference, right? Well, I think it goes back to if we were to look at the cost of somebody being on, you know, with major depressive disorder, or treatment resistant depression, not, you know, not being able to work or not being able to work consistently, uh, the, the, you know, years of treatment potentially, yeah. how much, how much, what's that cost overall versus, you know, one or two, uh, you know, psychedelic therapeutic sessions with, with therapy. You know, that, that's all what a lot of people are talking about. I, know. I think it would be great to see those costs as well. Wouldn't it? It would. Yeah. We'll see that I, in I suspect time. it'll be, I suspect it will be uh, a, a way to sort of change the current model. Yeah. Great to see you guys. Great yeah, to see likewise. you as well. Safe travels. Thank Appreciate you. you checking in and uh, let's keep in Thanks touch on how things us. are developing. Okay. Great. Absolutely. Enjoy the rest of your Thanks, conference. Chad. You too. <laughs> okay. So what'd you all think of the interview? Did you like what we recorded with our guests? Then leave a comment below and let us know what you thought of it. And if there's any more questions you want us to ask, as usual, share this video with your network, click on that bell for all notifications, and most importantly, subscribe to our channel because we would not be here without you. Thanks for watching, everyone.